Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our next session for Sports Philanthropy World. We're very excited to have with us a special panel today. We have from the Rose Bowl Institute, Charlie Firestone, from Peach Bowl, Gary Stoken, and from LA84, Renata Simro. I'm going to do a brief introduction of each of our panelists, uh, their, their accomplishments. It would probably take us the whole session if we went through a full background. But uh, I want to start with Renata. Renata is the CEO of LA84. She's an accomplished civic and private sector trailblazer with more than 20 years of diversified experience with commitment to leadership and service. She most recently served as senior VP and chief of staff to the publisher of the LA Times, where she oversaw staff operations and special projects. Her earlier career included three seasons with the LA Dodgers, where she served as senior VP of external affairs, overseeing the restoration of the Dodgers brand and the Dodgers Foundation. Gary Stoken is the CEO of Peach Bowl Inc., a position he has held since 1998 as CEO and president of Peach Bowl Inc., which has generated an economic impact of more than 1.05 billion and 64.2 million in direct governmental tax revenue for the city of Atlanta and state of Georgia since 1999. Gary has positioned the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl as one of the best bowl game organizations in the nation and earned the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl a position in the New Year's Six Bowl game. Uh, with the college football playoff, along with the Rose, Sugar, Orange, Fiesta, and Cotton Bowls. This year, the CFP re rewarded the Peach Bowl with a six-year extension to remain part of the New Year's Six and host future CFP semifinal games in 2019, 2022, and 2025, and he inked an eight-year contract with Mercedes-Benz Stadium through 2025. And Charlie Firestone is the president of the Rose Bowl Institute, which is an arm of the Rose Bowl Legacy Foundation. The Rose Bowl Institute champions sportsmanship, leadership, and citizenship, and leverages the power of sports to unite people everywhere. Prior to the Rose Bowl Institute, he was VP at the Aspen Institute, executive director of his communication policy program for 30 years, and for three years, Executive VP of the Aspen Institute for Policy Programs and International Activities. So Renata, Gary, Charlie, welcome to welcome today. Thank you. Good morning, Roy. Thank you. So I, I, I wanna start, uh, it's, it's great to have a panel where we've got everybody with uh, these professional backgrounds, some uh, great organizations represented there. Uh, Renata, I know you're in front of the, the stadium hosting the, Super Bowl coming up in February. So tell us a little bit about the kind of work that's leading up to next year's Super Bowl. Sure, and um, you know, before I um, get to that, Gary, I, I mean, uh, Roy, I think um, just the background on the LAD4 Foundation is certainly the quintessential legacy, not just in the US, but globally. Um, in 1984, as many um, might know, LA had a surplus of $232.5 million. And one of the commitments that the uh, Olympic Legacy or the Olympic Organizing Committee left was that they would invest those funds into youth sports. And for 36 years, we've been making direct service grants, uh, coaching education and infrastructure development in the eight counties that make up Los Angeles. So when I took over the organization about uh, six years ago, a colleague of mine uh, who runs the LA Sports and Entertainment Commission uh, Kathy Sloshman, and that is the organization in Southern California that bids on major sporting events to bring them to Los Angeles. Um, we started in 2017 with the U.S. Amateur, 2018 was the uh, NBA All-Star Game, and obviously one of the quintessential um, major sporting events is the Super Bowl, which we're hosting in 2022. And our organization, as well as our charitable arm, the Play Equity Fund, has become their plug-and-play partner. Uh, to really um, help them think through what is the legacy that we want to leave for each of these major, major sporting events. Uh, for example, for the U.S. Amateur, we created a program um, that uh, engages girls and kids of color in the game of golf. Uh, and we're doing that over a nine-year period of time with our partner, the Riviera Country Club, that will be the host venue for golf in the 28 Olympic Games. And so it's an opportunity for us to pay that legacy forward, you know, 17 to 28 uh, is a nice long run of being able to leave a legacy. We're looking to do the same thing with the Super Bowl. We just announced a couple of weeks ago 
our Champion Shine Here program, where we're identifying 56 legacy, 56 small nonprofit organizations throughout Southern California and providing them with a grant and a professionally produced video uh, that really helps them get awareness and visibility around these organizations that are showing up every day and having impact in their community. Um, and the last thing that I'll say is it's really um, our work with this Los Angeles Sports and Entertainment Commission and these various host committees is a great way to make these day long, week long, you know, weekend long events um, have impact and last much longer uh, than the games are played. Uh, and so it's been a phenomenal uh, partnership and collaboration here in Southern California. And we look forward to the five or six major sporting events that are planned for Los Angeles between now and the 28 Olympic Games. Well, it sounds like you have a full agenda there. And, and obviously the, the one of the key words as it is right in the title in terms of the legacy. Um, you know, Gary, you've been working hard in Atlanta to create that, that pool and, and set of resources, pool of revenue and set of resources to make an impact on, on the Atlanta community. And what's interesting to me is how to define the scope of where where your geographic impact is around the Peach Bowl and, and how you make the selections of what types of projects you want to undertake. Well, Roy, thanks for having us. I admire what you're doing and everybody on this call, uh, both Renata and Charlie, appreciate your involvement and as well as everybody on the call here. I see some friends name on this. I don't see their faces. So um, you guys are doing great jobs in the communities that you serve. So we, um, we take the approach that we want to do three things, really. One is a pillar of helping children. Uh, secondly, is to uh, fortify educational opportunities. And then lastly, we want to take a look at what we can do both in our community and around uh, our partners uh, to help them with uh, maybe the devastating events that have taken place. So um, we, were, we were born back in 1968 by the Lions Lighthouse as a, uh, a charity, a game for charity. And so we've uh, kept that in our mission. We remain the most charitable bull organization in the country. Since 1999, we've given uh, $57.9 million back in charity and scholarship donations. Um, which makes us number one out of all 41 bull organizations and uh, meets our mission. So uh, those are kind of the three pillars we look at in how we uh, give back to the community. Um, beyond the over $225 million that we've given to the schools in payouts uh, over the many years that uh, we've been in existence. So I want to turn to, to Charlie now. You, you've... Uh done a lot of work in space, uh, you know, through the Aspen Institute and, and now in your role with the Rose Bowl Institute. Um, what made you jump in uh, after such a long tenure uh, out in, uh, in DC to, to moving coasts and uh, taking on the, the lead of, of creating a legacy through the Rose Bowl Institute? Well, it, it was a no brainer. First of all, I was moving to, I already had moved to California, but um, the opportunity to champion sportsmanship and our, as you mentioned, our uh, mission is sportsmanship, leadership and citizenship. And basically to make that connection between sportsmanship and citizenship, which I'd like to, uh, which, we're, which we're going to do by sending athletes into schools uh, to talk about sportsmanship as citizenship. So just stepping back for a second, the Rose Bowl, first of all, there are three different organizations. There's the Rose Bowl Stadium, which is owned by the city of Pasadena. There's the Tournament of Roses Committee, which, which uh, sponsors the Rose Bowl game. And then there's the Rose Bowl Legacy Foundation, which uh, among other things, uh, uh, created the Rose Bowl Institute, which is what I'm a part of. And our idea is that just as there are great sports moments at the Rose Bowl, there are great sports values that need to be uh, permeated throughout the society. Um, and particularly the sportsmanship mentality over the win at all costs mentality. So that's our ultimate goal is to really uh, promote a kind of mentality revolution, just like we have in littering and smoking and other things. We can 
uh, over time uh, improve people's um, values in, in, in that sense. But we're doing it in a variety of ways. Uh, we do have some local programming for the city of Pasadena, uh, particularly on race and sports. We're gonna do something on this fall, uh, uh, two things on Latinos in sports, one in baseball and one in football, uh, honoring uh, the one in football, honoring Danny Villanueva, the uh, kicker from um, the Rams and the Cowboys. And um, we have also, in addition to our, our uh, regular programming, are about to embark on some areas of uh, such as sports um, diplomacy and uh, innovation in sports. So we have a broad agenda to bring sports values into the broader society. Well, what, what's interesting when you listen to the descriptions from the three organizations, the breadth uh, and scope of the types of programs that you're working on and, and the reach that you have is enormous. So Renata, when you put together the, the plans Right, you you have so many opportunities to make an impact. There's um, never a shortage of organizations and, and ideas that are out there. Take us a little bit through the process of how you sharpen and kind of focus in on where where you want to make that impact and how you make those decisions. Yeah, sure. That's a great question, um, Roy. And you know, just an observation uh, listening to Charlie and Gary. Uh, I think in the through line between all of our organizations, which I find when I talk to or you know, share with colleagues across the country is that the legacy is the organizational structure that each of these major sporting events have set up. So when you think about Gary since 1968, it's like he's the go-to, the plug and play, the opportunity to really learn and understand the community. Um, certainly Charlie with the legacy and the icon that is the Rose Bowl. And so I think that's an important point to note with the audience is as is some might be thinking about, you know, how to leverage um, major sporting events to create legacy is that I find having an organization like the LAD4 Foundation that will be here long after that event, um, you know, comes and goes is an important element of really creating lasting change in the communities that need it most and certainly legacy. But to your original question about um, how um, it starts with the partner. So just, you know, Super Bowl is right around the corner. Um, you know, we had conversations um, bring together the Super Bowl host committee that's chaired by Casey Wasserman, and obviously our partners at the Los Angeles Sports and Entertainment Commission. And then we engage conversations with the Rams and the Chargers, as well as the NFL Foundation, of really what, is, what are the pillars that you're looking to make impact and change? We looked at Super Bowls across, um, you know, the last you know, decade and, and what legacy did those cities leave? Um, and then certainly the experience that we have uh, with the organizations um, that are here in Los Angeles, you know, we're all coming out of COVID and last year was devastating to a lot of nonprofit organizations just in terms of their funding, their ability to be visible, um, yet they showed up and still had impact on the communities that they serve. And, you know, being familiar with that and taking the feedback from our partners, um, we have a program called Champions Shine here. Um, and we said, you know, let's really shine a light. Um, the Super Bowl is one of the most, you know, iconic events. Um, you know, it, it's, <laughs> I've learned that Monday is now a Super Bowl holiday, um, you know, as I've been engaging in, in football over the years. And why not turn that light of the event that is the Super Bowl onto the community organizations? And, you know, obviously this is Super Bowl 56. And so we decided to honor 56 organizations. And our, our area of focus is youth sports. But with our partner, the Play Equity Fund, we can go a bit broader than that. And so we set up the legacy to really focus on three pillars. One is uh, jobs and economic opportunity. Uh, the second is on youth and youth sport and play opportunities. And the third pillar is social justice. Uh, and that was really important because it was a through line between all of the organizations and really um, highlighting and again, shining a light on these organizations that are really trying to make us better. I'm mindful, Charlie, of the great work that you guys do in terms of, you know, live like you play, let's be better citizens. And so when you think about the power of sport and teamwork and collaboration, you can be, um, you know, engage with folks from all walks of life on your team and you're focused on one common purpose to win games and to win championships, but you win with grace, you weather defeat, you pick yourself up. If we can take those elements of what make great sports great uh, and the, 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 and the, the fandom great, and if we can put that into society, 
you know, we just imagine how great this world could be in terms of using sport to bring us together. Um, so I'd say partnership, collaboration, listening, and, you know, certainly the legacy that we've had in knowing LA and Southern California so well um, that we've, um, you know, pretty excited that we're able to really uplift these organizations that don't necessarily get the rec recognition that they deserve. So as you go through that process of uplifting, and you said you identified 56 organizations that you're going to work with in, in recognition of the Super Bowl 56, how does that process work and what kind of timeline does that take in terms of identifying um, and, and selecting those groups? Is that like an open RFP? Is it just, uh, in a sense, hand-to-hand -hand conversations to see who you think is the best fit or, or how does that process flow? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. Um, and we started earlier this year, um, conceptualizing it actually two years ago and started the program this year. And it was an open nomination process. So we basically went to the sports teams. We went to my board. We went to the Super Bowl host committee board. And then we opened it up for public nomination. So we've got over 400 organizations nominated. Um, and you can imagine vetting uh, and going through the selection pro process and criteria was quite a Herculean task. Uh, the structure that we have in the organization, the resources, again, is the plug and play partner for the Super Bowl host committee. And that's through our charitable arm, the Play Equity Fund. And then we established a selection committee with a criteria. And the selection committee was made of uh, community members and then folks involved within either the Super Bowl host committee organizations you know, who helped to match the NFL's contribution to the legacy program. And we went through a very arduous vetting process. And, you know, really the goal was to pick unsung heroes. And so while there are larger organizations like the Boys and Girls Club, um, YMCA and the like, who are doing incredible work, we really wanted these organizations to be unsung heroes that don't necessarily get the limelight and the recognition they deserve. And we're happy that of the 56, or proud, I should say, of the 56 organizations that were selected, nearly half of them were um, with budgets of less than a half a million dollars a year. And so we really got to grassroots organization. The last thing I'll say is in addition to the grant that they get, six of them are going to get a larger grant. So 10, 50 organizations get $10,000 grant. And then we're going through a selection process to give a little bit higher um, grant amount to organizations for them to make a larger impact. But all of them are getting professionally produced videos uh, that we're providing to them to use for their marketing purposes, for their fundraising purposes. And then we're also engaging with our uh, media partners um, to shine a light and, and to give them some visibility either in print media, social media, or through our broadcast media partners um, so that we can share the work that they're doing with not just Los Angeles and Southern California, but really the, the world and the NFL platform so that people who wanna get involved now have a menu of 56 organizations that are doing great work that they can get involved with and help uh, expand the work and the impact that they're doing in communities across the city. Well, as you identified, there's 400 some organizations that even got nominated. That's a testament to how great the need is, and, and no matter how much money is raised, there, there's always a greater and, and greater need. Uh, you know that uh, somebody could drop a, a huge sum on you and, and you, those organizations would be able to absorb it pretty quickly and certainly improve the, the work that they're doing in the community. So Gary, similar question for you, um, a little bit different focus as, as you come through the Peach Bowl. Um, what's the process of identifying the, the core initiatives that are important for the Peach Bowl? Well, uh, Renata hit on it. I think uh, the most important thing you can do is develop partnerships. And just to give you an example of two of them that we've developed, one is with the Atlanta Public School System, uh, which controls and manages the 11 um, Atlanta Public Schools in the city. And we've started with uh, back in 2018 when we hosted the national championship, CFP national championship, of uh, uh, partnering with our title sponsor, Chick-fil-A, as well as uh, we on the host committee in the Peach Bowl. And we raised $2 million to uh, really create a teaching format for third grade teachers, because it's proven if kids cannot read on grade by third grade, they won't graduate grade, uh, grade school, let alone high school, and then they become 
unfortunately, um, uh, you know, uneducated and unable to get a job and unable to move forward with their life. So um, we, we raised that uh, with the young kids, uh, first, second, and third graders. And then we put an academic coach in each of the uh, 11 Atlanta public high schools. And that academic coach works with uh, all the student athletes uh, from softball to volleyball to football to baseball, basketball, whatever. Um, number one, to get their SAT and ACT scores up. Number two, to get their GPAs up. So A, they can graduate high school and B, they have the grade point average in the ACT and SAT to get into a university. And then thirdly, uh, we donate $100,000 to each team back to their school in an endowed scholarship uh, to each university that participates in the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. We now have $7.5 million in endowed scholarships throughout 34 universities around the country. And we earmark those endowed scholarships at those universities for the Atlanta public high school kids so that they now can pay for their college once they graduate high school. Uh, and we just renamed it this year, the John Lewis Courage, uh, Freedom of Courage Scholarship at those 35 universities. So that's one example. We partner with Atlanta Public School. The other example is we partnered with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, where we donated $20 million to eradicate childhood cancer. Um, there's a, what the doctors will tell you in a lot of these drugs that they're in trials, they're trying to form to create some uh, cure to get to the FDA so it can be mandated to become a drug that you can use on children. There's a valley of death. Uh, they run out of funding basically. And so that, that uh, trial never gets across the line for the FDA to approve it. Um, so we now have seven active trials going on um, for everything from uh, neuroplast neuroplasm plastic surgery to um, leukemia to um, all, all different kind of tumors and, and cancers in children. There's only 4% of the NIH, National Institute of Health budget that goes to childhood cancer. So the doctors that we talked to have told us we need some funding to get these trials across the line. So we're working with St. Louis uh, Children's Hospital, Los Angeles Children's Hospital, Pittsburgh. Um, all these hospitals are working with the doctors of Children's Healthcare of Atlanta Children's Hospital to um, make sure these trials get across the line. And now that they have funding, um, we hope that our goal is to come up with a cure for one of these childhood cancers because every, every kid deserves a life. And uh, there's too many of them dying of childhood cancer right now. So that's example playing off Renata's theme of partnership that we've created and developed and really having a huge impact on, uh, on, on youth and, and kids. Well, certainly that's a great impact. And as you said, uh, every child deserves a chance uh, at, at health. And I know, you know, uh, LA 84 and the Play Equity Fund do a lot of work together in terms of giving every child a chance to participate in, in, in sports. You know, Charlie, as, as you look at the, the lens from, from the Rose Bowl Institute, it's a little bit different than uh, the Peach Bowl in LA 84 in, in that it's new. So you, you had the, the opportunity really to set the stage and, and dictate the, the direction right from the start. So take us through that process a little bit of, of how you envisioned uh, the Institute. Right, well, it is on sports values, as I mentioned originally, and, and sportsmanship is a very broad, uh, broad topic. Um, I would you know, relate to Gary's uh, points, which is that there are other cancers that aren't quite as obvious, including civic illiteracy and apathy. And so one of the things we uh, want to do is increase um, civic literacy, which is a, uh, a big, and, and it's something that I dealt with a lot at the Aspen Institute, the need for civic literacy. And um, in this attention economy where 
uh, we have so much information overload and lack of attention. The, the things that do get attention are hate, anger, fear, sensationalism, and sports. And so what we're trying to do is get uh, people's attention, particularly kids in, in schools, uh, but in many other areas, um, attention through sports figures and uh, then address uh, the analogies of sports to uh, citizenship, meaning appreciation of the game, fair play, um, teamwork, and uh, respect, uh, respectful competition. And those relate to understanding the democratic process, the rule of law, uh, collaboration for collective action, and um, respecting the opponent. Uh, I've got a, an op-ed coming out uh, shortly on your opponent is not your enemy, um, you know, and too much in our society, uh, we see that, but in sports, we don't, uh, or, you know, most people don't, there are, <laughs> there's always, there's always differences, but so, uh, so it really went to the value system of our country that is, uh, you know, is very strong. Um, we have a, one, there's a great quote by Nelson Mandela, which is sport has the ability to uh, improve people's lives and cut across, I, I, I'm not giving the quote, uh, but it cuts across um, people's uh, political filters and it unites people, sports unites people. We don't, look, we don't look with our political filters at who our fellow fans are when we are supporters of the you know, Los Angeles Rams or whoever, whatever team, we, we're fellow fans or we're, you know, and uh, it, it does uh, bring people together. And that's really the, the mission. Um, how we got there, uh, we have an advisory board of uh, 44 outstanding people, many of them name athletes um, who have helped uh, you know, our, our process, but uh, mainly it was coming in with a, with a vision of uh, promoting these, these three major uh, values of sportsmanship, leadership, and citizenship. Well, you talked about, uh, go I ahead, Renata. Can I chime in really quickly? You know, Charlie, I, 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 I was so resonating on, on, on what you were just saying. And I was at, uh, I got invited to, I'm a Lakers fan, just for the record, but I got invited to the last game of the first round of the playoffs for the Clippers. And it was, a, it was in a suite and it was, I knew two people in the suite, didn't know anybody else. And if you know that game, at halftime, you thought the Clippers were done. And they just had this incredible third quarter comeback. And in the fourth quarter, as it got really close, you know, we're hugging, high-fiving these complete strangers around the energy and the passion to root the Clippers on to victory. And so I think, you know, what you, what you guys are focused on is so important and being able to take that element of, you know, team, team spirit and of collaboration and collegialism and just, you know, connecting with strangers around a sporting event, you know, has so much, um, so much impact in society. So I just, it just hit me, you know, recently that, Again, and I was even rooting for the Clippers, and I'm a Laker fan. So I think you, you're definitely on to something and in, in, in good work that you guys are doing. So apologize for that, Roy, but it just struck my nerve. Thank you, Renata. Also, if I could, Roy, uh, follow up the theme of partnerships that, you know, we're a really small organization, we're brand new, but we partner. So we're partnering with the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, which is the third largest museum website in the country. Um, and uh, in terms of leaving materials behind to the schools. And we're partnering with, with teams that are already sending athletes into schools. So we're not the booking agent. We're going to uh, organizations such as the professional teams and college uh, teams. And we're in the process of doing that right now. So far we're, we're working with uh, uh, the Galaxy in uh, Carson uh, and that part of uh, Southern California and um, in Phoenix with uh, Ele Elevate Phoenix. Um, and so we'll be going to those as pilot programs, but we eventually hope to be sending uh, our materials. Uh, we basically have talking points for the athletes who can then take it however they want 
and uh, materials to leave behind that can at least get the attention of the kids who idolize those athletes. Well, I think you've all touched on the fact that sports has an enormous power to, to bring people together, to, to bring a, a Laker fan like Renata to, to <laughs> collaborate and connect with uh, Clippers fans. Um, I mean, you see it all the time. You know, I, I know that the, I love that quote about the, the opponent is not your enemy because I, I think what's interesting about sports is you need both of those mentalities, right? While the competition is going on, you, you have to be all out and, and competing every possible way you can to, to win that, that game. But uh, the Stanley Cup to me epitomizes that, that sportsmanship at, at the end of a series, no matter how hard fought it is, no matter how many penalties or fights or cheap shots or anything else you might see during the course of the series, when it's done, they, they all stand in line patiently and, and shake hands with every single person and, and say a few words. And it, in today's world, uh, you see so many of these situations where somebody's on a different side of an issue and they, they won't even have the conversation with somebody with a different viewpoint. They will, will not, they'll just write that person off or write off that relationship because of the differences. So Charlie, as you go through the work that you're doing with the Rose Bowl Institute, how do you change that mentality and culture? Yeah, well, it's a long-term process and uh, you know, little by little, but um, you know, we've, as I said, we've done it with littering. We've done it with smoking. There's, there are mentalities and we're going through a mentality revolution, you know, Black Lives Matter and uh, Me Too movements are changes in mentality. And we, you know, it's, it's, it takes a lot of time, but it starts with awareness. Uh, one, another thing we're doing is gonna be giving out, starting next year, giving out what we call the Rosies, the Rose Bowl Sportsmanship Initiative Award in Sportsmanship. So um, we, we hope to, by recognizing outstanding acts of sportsmanship, that uh, it'll bring attention to this, this issue. And, you know, people talking about what is sportsmanship uh, and, you know, why is it important? And, you know, just, it's, it's a long-term, it's not gonna happen in my lifetime, <laughs> but I do think that we can, you know, we can move the needle. Uh, and that's where we're, you know, you, unless you start, uh, you know, the, you have to, as uh, old analogies, you know, each each game play one game at a time, or each step, you know, you begin with one. A long journey begins with a single step. Whatever you want to say, uh, you just have to start plugging at it. Charlie, there's a great partner for you in St. Louis. Uh, Frank Viverito and the St. Louis Sports Commission actually have uh, a sportsmanship award show that's broadcast on CBS. And you may want to make contact with Frank Viverito up at the St. Louis Sports Commission with your. Uh, yeah, I'd love to. I'm actually, I was, I'm actually from St. Louis, and maybe, uh, maybe there's a partnership there that you can create with Frank. He's a great guy, and they do a great job. It's broadcast, um, and I think it's, if, if I'm not mistaken, it's named at Stan Musial Awards. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The Stan Musial Sportsmanship. Yeah, that's yeah. true. There is that. Can you send me his name afterwards? Sure. Yeah, I'd be glad to. That'd be great. Well, I, I think sportsmanship is something that that underlies all of the the competition that is out there, and and certainly something that needs to take on a greater focus. We read the stories of uh, the parents at competitions and uh, the challenges that go on right now for officials in terms of how they're treated at sporting events and, and things like that, but. It's going to be interesting to watch how, how that develops. But I want to go back to Renata now for a minute. You've got a lot of exciting things coming up in L.A. over the next few years. Take us a little bit through some of the planning that you're doing to get ready for those events and some of the partnerships you're creating to uh, expand programs or create new initiatives. Sure. Um, and, you know, we take one step at a time. Uh, it's we're right now executing on the Super Bowl legacy, but we also have in 23 uh, the college football playoffs is coming to SoFi Stadium and the U.S. Open of Golf. Um, and we don't, and then we also have the um, rescheduled all star game baseball game is coming to Dodger Stadium 
that was postponed due to COVID. And the Dodgers Foundation, under the leadership of Nicole Whiteman, you know, just doing extraordinary things. And so we don't need to lean in on that. They've got the legacy down pat and are actually executing. They just opened an additional Dodger Dreamfield last Saturday as part of their legacy for the All-Star game. But as it relates to the college football playoffs and the U.S. Open, you know, right now we're just in discussion points with those. Each of the major sporting events has a separate host committee um, that's established to put on those games and to host um, those particular events. And we partner and engage with the host committee. And with the college football um, uh, championships, as Gary um, so well knows, maybe I need to call you, Gary, and just get some insight. Um, I love the third grade reading. You know, we're really exploring what is the college football playoff foundation's goals and objectives, and it's squarely focused on schools and teachers. Uh, and so how can we be true to that mission and that um, impact that they're looking to make while still making it unique and important to the Southern California landscape? So we're just in conversations about, you know, how do we align with the College Football Playoffs Foundation and the Super Bowl host committee and what will a legacy look like, you know, here in Southern California? Um, so that's my homework actually over the next couple of months before we reconvene to say, you know, what does that look like? Um, so that's usually the planning process. We start, you know, in this case, you know, a year and a half in advance of the event coming so that we make sure that we're able to give it the appropriate um, thought process and impact and then partnership uh, before we start to execute on those programs. On July 7th, we're having a conversation with the US Open of Golf Host Committee, partnering again with Southern California, um, uh, Southern California Golf Association and their foundation, who will likely be the organization that is the um, implementer of that legacy program, but bring our thought leadership in collaboration with a variety of organizations and golf clubs. Again, each and every city um, neighborhood uh, where these major sporting events take place, you know, making sure that it actually has impact for that particular unique neighborhood and the needs within that community. And so there's a lot of conversations, partnership, collaboration, um, you know, thought leadership, coordination with organizations before you actually see the benefit, you know, going back to Super Bowl, you know, last week we uh, had a big press conference and highlighted the 56 organizations at a big event at SoFi Stadium. There's a lot of work and collaboration and rolling up your sleeves that go into um, these major sporting events and the legacy that we seek to leave. The other point, um, Roy, that I really want to under, underscore for the, for the audience that's listening and, you know, maybe thinking about how to scale the impact of these major sporting events, leverage the major impact of these sporting events is, you know, Gary, again, um, you know, is an, an organization, an institution that's rooted in Atlanta, um, you know, around the major sporting events that come and they're able to, you know, have staying power and sustainability um, in the way in which, you know, they receive their funding and being able to have their staff. I mean, I think not dissimilar to what Charlie and certainly the legacy of the 84 Olympic games you know, I often say uh, when people call to ask for thought leadership or advice of, you know, how do we re recreate what you've done in Southern California through the L84 Foundation? And I, I think it's a challenge to try to recreate $232.5 million in surplus from an Olympic Games. We're certainly hopeful that the 28 Olympic Games, um, you know, is able to exceed what we were able to do. But the fact that we have an organization, um, we've invested our money in an endowment, and so I don't have to worry about, um, and it's grateful, you know, fundraising to cover our overhead, um, that we know we're going to be here, you know, year in and year out, we're going to be able to be consistent and sustainable with carrying on these legacies from the major sporting events. And now with the um, creation uh, of our charitable uh, partner, the Play Equity Fund, you know, that's the vehicle that we're able to augment the budget that we have on the L84 Foundation side, because Play Equity is, as is, is you touched on briefly, you know, before COVID-19, there was a crisis hiding in plain sight that not all young kids have access to sport and the power of sport and play that we're talking about this morning. Uh, and that we are squarely rooted on play as a social justice issue and making sure that every kid, regardless of zip code, regardless of gender, regardless of ability, regardless of where they look, where they live or what they look like, that they have the opportunity should they choose to experience a transformational power sport. And we've been able to align um, that charitable arm with the work that we do at L84 Foundation and the work in partnership that we do with these major sporting events and their corresponding host committees. Um, so it's um, going back to your original question. Um, the process starts, you know, 18 months, you know, 20, mo 20 months uh, in advance. And it's really interesting. And Gary, I know you can appreciate this. 
when Casey and I bid on the Super Bowl back in 2016, it seemed like uh, 2022 was decades, you know, mm -hmm. away. And when, when we got together last uh, last week to announce the, uh, the, the the legacy program, you know, we just kind of smiled at each other and said, wow, it seems just like yesterday we were bidding on the games and it's like it's on you in a heartbeat. So certainly having that anchor organization like the Rose Bowl Institute and like the, um, the Peach Bowl, you know, organization are really important and being able to have the desired impact at each of these organizations and organizations that might be listening, you know, on this call this morning, um, you know, are looking to make in the communities that they serve. And you, you touched on so many important parts there and, and going back, as you said, to have the comfort that you've got the endowment and don't have to worry about raising your operational costs is, is a big factor because so many of the funders and grant makers uh, have, I guess the best word is a distaste for funding those types of things, even though they're crucial and important to operating an organization. You can't operate a, a strong organization without that infrastructure, but people would much rather support direct grants or, or programs than building that, that infrastructure. And so that, that's been a great opportunity there and we look forward to following that success. Gary, with the Peach Bowl, um, you, you've got that built-in uh, driver in terms of the games and in terms of the CFP uh, and the relationship with Mercedes-Benz Stadium and the opportunity to bring events there. Talk a little bit about how you envision the, the next few years. I know you're still involved with the, the CFP and some upcoming events there, but beyond that, what's what else is on the horizon? Yeah, thanks, Roy. And Renata, I'm sure you're in touch with Britton Banowski of uh, the CFP. He does a great job with uh, teachers and uh, you'll have a lot of fun with him and really impacting teachers through the national championship game out there as we have. Um, Roy, to answer your question, we, we've kind of looked at uh, creating our own events to further our funding. You know, we use the theme created to give back in 1968 when we were founded. And so we've created a golf tournament, the Peach Bowl Challenge, where we bring in the head coaches like Nick Saban and Dabo Sweeney and Brian Kelly and Mac Brown uh, to, to play. And uh, we give money back to their, the coaches foundations and charities uh, through them playing in our golf tournament. So this year, our golf tournament, we gave $330,000 back to each of the coaches foundations. Um, so we're, we're also raising events, creating uh, events to raise money to further help us uh, with our charitable donations. We've also created a touchdown for children's. So you can sign up. Uh, we use the coaches that play in our golf tournament to do a video for us, similar to what Renata was mentioning. Uh, to reach out to fans of Alabama or Clemson or Notre Dame, et cetera. And for every touchdown that university scores, they can match it with a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, whatever. And uh, last year we raised a million dollars and we matched that and gave a million dollars match. And uh, that money went into our, our Peach Bowl legacy fund to further fund childhood cancer uh, initiatives. So we're, we're not only putting on a bowl game, but we're putting and raising other uh, events to raise other monies to fortify our charitable giving. So um, that's what's kind of fun about this. We're, we're not a, as I tell my staff, we're, we're not a bowl game. We're not, you know, just put on college football kickoff games. Uh, we're created to give. And so all of our initiatives have a huge charitable component to it. And that's why we've been able to give out $58 million since, uh, since 1999. So Gary, with, when you look at some of the upcoming events that you've created, give us a couple that you're excited about. Yeah, so we, we have this year, we have Alabama versus Miami uh, to open the college football season. Um, and we have Louisville Ole Miss and then at the end of the year, we'll have two top 10 teams in our Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. Um, I should mention also, we, we, uh, we really looked at college football and how we can use college football to really impact Atlanta. And so we've done it through the education system, through Atlanta Public Schools. 
We've done it with children's health through children's health care. And then we looked at the greater community and said, okay, what's an asset uh, that, that would impact the community where you can create a lot of different things. So we went out and we brought the College Football Hall of Fame. We moved it from South Bend, Indiana to Atlanta. We put $13 million into the building of it and maintaining it. And now it's creating different uh, STEM events for, for kids, educational events. Um, uh, we, we celebrate Black History Month every February with uh, all the great uh, athletes that are in the College Football Hall of Fame. So it's just, you know, creating something like that throws off all different kind of opportunities. We host fundraisers, we'll be hosting a fundraiser honoring the Georgia Tech 1990 National Championship team in October, where we bring back the team and we reach out to Georgia Tech alumni to fundraise for Lions Lighthouse, where we'll raise $300,000 for them in one evening. So um, we, are, we are not a college football bowl organization. We are a igniter of created to give back to our community in the various ways I've mentioned in the past. So Charlie, turning over to, uh, to the Rose Bowl now, um, obviously one of the iconic stadiums there. Talk a little bit about how uh, you, you referenced the different moving parts of sort of the Rose Bowl brand between the stadium, the Tournament of Roses, the game, the Institute, the Legacy Foundation. Um, how challenging is it to connect the vision between those different groups in terms of what you want to accomplish through the Institute? Well, uh, hmm. the, the tournament, of Ro I mean, we're all on uh, pretty decent terms, although the, I guess you know that the Tournament of Roses Committee actually sued the city of Pasadena. Uh, and I don't have anything to do with, with any of that. That's over the uh, movement last year of the Rose Bowl game to Arlington, Texas, uh, and uh, who, who actually controls the trademark. But uh, so that's really a, a side uh, matter. Uh, we are on good terms at the Institute with the uh, Tournament of Roses Committee. We don't do joint activities, frankly. Um, and we're constantly in touch with the Rose Bowl. You know, basically, we're part of the Rose Bowl Stadium. And and the city council and um, you know relations with that. So, um, so what that's resulted in uh, that latter point is to do some local programming for the city of Pasadena. Uh, as I mentioned, we're, we've got those two programs coming up on, particularly on the uh, Latino populations um, in in uh, Pasadena are aimed at that. So we're doing something on for Danny Villanueva's uh, legacy and also in um in baseball uh we're gonna do something on the the documentary bad hombres which showed on showtime uh about a binational uh laredo and new laredo baseball team um but uh you know more broadly we are <clears throat> you know like we uh have mentioned before we're partnering with anybody not anybody but we're we're open to partnerships uh, with appropriate uh, organizations. And uh, down the line, maybe we will do something directly with the Tournament of Roses Committee, which is also a, a committee that I think uh, raises money and uh, gives out money. We're not, a, as opposed to Gary's and Renata's organizations, we're not a grant giving organization um, uh, at this point, though we have given out scholarships. We have a Women's Empowerment Symposium uh, that gives out uh, four scholarships. Uh, they're only, you know, they're not, they don't cover full tuition. Uh, and we're also giving out the um, Christina Mauser Foundation scholarships. Christina was one of the, she was the coach who died in the uh, Kobe Bryant helicop helicopter crash. And her husband uh, has created a foundation and has raised money to give out scholarships to uh, people who exemplify the values of Christina, who was a, a great coach and humanitarian. Well, all, all three of you have done amazing work and uh, your organizations are 
truly making an impact uh, across your communities. I want to give everybody one last uh, shot at, at closing comments in terms of looking ahead. Where, where can people help other than making contributions to the cause, Renata? What would be something that would be really helpful for, for LA84, for people in our community and our network to be able to help you with? Making contributions to the cause. <laughs> Um, yeah, resources are key, and I think when you uh, when we look at uh, you know the impact that we've been able to have, starting with again the U.S. Amateur, you know we've started created a golf for all program again to get girls and kids of color engaged in the beautiful game of golf, and that was a result of the Riviera Country Club and Michael Yamaki raising more funds than they had to um, they had to to put on the event. The NBA um, All Star Game, our partnership with the NBA Players Association Foundation and being able to do court refurbishments over a three year period of time and re-upping, you know, certainly resources are the key, um, number one. But number two, I think is partnerships. So it, the, the problems that we're dealing with, um, you know, in terms of community, be it teachers in schools and read by, read by third grade, if it's um, citizenship on, on, on sports and society and, you know, how do you really bring the best of sports and the teams to the general public into democracy and civic engagement, or if it's youth sports and the inequities that exist there, the problems are really large. And for us to be able to have sustained impact, that it requires us to engage in partnerships. And we're proud that um, it, it, the partnerships, and then I think the third is just figuring out ways to get involved, be it volunteering, um, you know, being, uh, showing up for your own kids, you know, game, being able to demonstrate, you know, good sportsmanship, you know, when your kids, um, you know, from a youth perspective, you know, when they finish a game, you know, don't start breaking down the X's and O's, you know, perhaps the first conversation a parent can ha have is, you know, did you have fun? You know, what was fun today for that game? So I think starting to shift and change your mindset, but being aware of where those opportunities, large and small, can present themselves. And, you know, Roy, I have to say, I'm really proud of um, the work that we've done with the Play Equity Fund and really powering and creating this Play Equity movement. Um, and what we're trying to do is to create a tent of opportunity and collaboration for sports teams, corporate brands, major sporting events, individuals, philanthropy, you know, to get connected to and tied to, you know, the focus of our work uh, to close the play equity gap together and finding ways in which for organizations to do that. So I'd say resources, partnerships, and large or small, just finding ways to get involved and be the change you want to see. Fantastic. Uh, we'll go. We'll go to Charlie next as as you get ready to close. What are the institute's growing? You've got some great vision for what you want to accomplish. Where where can our network and and members and organizations that are involved help that mission? I, I would say two things. One is partnering, uh, as Renata said, and particularly if you're already sending athletes into schools, uh, we'd love to talk to you about uh, our talking points and uh, what what your athletes are, are talking about. And secondly, amplifying. So if you believe in this, uh, these concepts that we've been talking about, just amplify them. Um, that's, that's the way in the long run they're gonna be adopted. And uh, it it's, uh, takes everybody to be engaged. It goes back to informed and engaged citizenship. So let's all be informed and engaged sports people. <laughs> and uh, looking at sportsmanship and, and being good citizens. Terrific. So Gary, we'll give you the last word here to, to clean up and uh, tell us where, where people can help the, the Peach Bowl in accomplishing its mission. Well, if I can, I'll, I'll break off on that and really praise you, Roy, and Renata, and Charlie for everything that you're doing. You know, having been an athlete um, and coached uh, in, in college, Sports is a great uh, uh, equalizer in life. Um, you know, whether it's black or white or Hispanic, uh, when you get on a team, there's nothing like uh, a family united together. And so we need to continue, all of us on this call, do great things. So I compliment everybody for taking the time to listen to Renata and Charlie uh, and Roy, but we all do great things. We need to continue to do them more so now than ever before in the society that we live in. And so let's use sports for the greater good. And like I like to say, it, you know, it's much better to give than receive. So let's just keep giving and creating and uh, making sure that 
the next generation we give back to them is better than, than what we have right now. So uh, Roy, I compliment you and, and your organization in putting this uh, uh, seminar together in this conference. And I congratulate everybody for spending the time together with Renata and Charlie and I. Well, thank you all for, for being here. Thank you for the kind words, Gary. Uh, we, we've got a great team that's helped put this event together and a lot of people who've graciously agreed to participate in the event and, and share their view from their organizations. Uh, appreciate having great leaders like the three of you uh, bringing in strong organizations and setting that role model and benchmark for others to follow. So thank you for spending your time with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And so we're, we're going to move on to our uh, next set of breakout sessions. So on the health and safety track, we've got governing and managing communication with youth. On the sports access track, we've got sport and development, uh, DEI track, uh, disabilities, the international track, Africa. We've got a fundraising track with major gifts and legacy. And on the skill development track, telling stories without reinforcing stereotypes. So uh, some great choices for this next panel. Thank you again to everybody for joining us. Renata, Charlie, Gary, thank you for being with us and sharing your time. And we'll see everybody soon. Thank you. Thanks.